Tonight, we're in Melbourne. Victoria is hours away from another snap lockdown. The Delta strain is changing the course of this pandemic and dashing our hopes of a COVID normal life. Welcome to Q&A. I'm Virginia Trioli. It's wonderful to be with you this evening. Just a few hours ago, we had an audience here planned of 100 people. We've paired that right back to just our questioners, given the imminent lockdown. Joining me on the panel tonight, GP and former AMA President Mukesh Hakawal, who's been on the front line of the COVID response from the beginning. Broadcaster and author Michelle Laurie, who co-hosts the Australian True Crime podcast. Radio broadcaster and a man of many opinions, Steve Price. Senior economist Alison Pennington. And from lockdown in Sydney, epidemiologist Mary Louise McClaws. Please make them all very welcome. <laughs> you can stream us live on iView and all the socials. Quanda is the hashtag. So please join the debate and let us know what you're thinking and how you're feeling at this very strange moment. Our first question comes from Tejas Balaraman. Um, we went through a long extended lockdown last year in Victoria and there were many mistakes made and we learned a lot of things. Uh, the last two weeks watching some of the stuff that's come out of New South Wales, it's felt like a bit of a flashback where I'm seeing some of the same things being repeated. You know, things like poor translation in communities where, you know, English speaking is low, the inconsistent rules, inconsistent messaging, unequal policing. Uh, has, do you guys feel like New South Wales has really learned from the mistakes Victoria made last year and incorporated that into their response? It's sort of the question everyone's been asking really, particularly as we go back down a bit because the, back down into lockdown because the infection spread here. Mary Louise McClaws will go straight to Sydney. Have you learnt from us? Good evening. First of all, I'd like to apologise <laughs> for getting our COVID, our COVID Delta strain. So, um, Answering that very simply is uh, we haven't really learned because we do everything on a state basis, not a national basis. So, for example, you learned from the second wave to go in early and go in hard, then get out early. Uh, you locked down on the third day when you had about 25 cases. We didn't lock down until we had 54 cases. Uh, you were in lockdown for 100 days until you got your last case. Uh, and that was on day 28. We're at day 29 and we have 900 and I think it was 30 cases. Mm. So did we learn? No, sadly, we didn't learn from your experience. We didn't learn from the UK experience that have been giving us fantastic reports through the Public Health England reports telling us about their anxiety of Delta. We didn't learn from the anxiety of the UK and the USA. The USA has been telling us that their uh, sequence specimens have been doubling in um, proportion uh, every two weeks for Delta now. We certainly did learn from your North Melbourne experience where you went in very heavy handedly and didn't use your uh, multicultural local community. We've gone in fairly heavy-handed, and I don't like seeing the police in Fairfield. Fairfield is about, um, on average, about 30% of the population, where the average is about 23%, that have, uh, you know, the high-density living, multi-generational uh, families, which is lovely, but the virus likes it. Uh, they can't work from home. Uh, about a third can't work from home, and the average level for Australia is about 20 Mm. And so we've got a recipe for uh, an area where the virus will take off. Mary Louise, and we're going to get to some of those issues later on. We've got some questions exactly yep. about that and actually a guest joining us from um, uh, Western Sydney as well. So let's go around the panel in answer to that question about learning from the Victorian experience. Alison, what do you reckon? Absolutely not. I think uh, from an economic perspective, some of the key implement, things that were implemented by the Victorian government to get out of our wave 
have not been observed, uh, have not been implemented at all. Um, we're talking the need to actually intervene into normal business operations and actually uh, instill something a bit stronger to actually you know, reduce output sometimes, reduce numbers of staff that are on site, uh, instill hospital grade PPE with, uh, in, in very high risk, high transmission environments. Um, what the Victorian government did to get out of, uh, to pull us through the last wave was to actually uh, you know, code every industry and workplace with a risk transmission um, setting. And so high risk environments were shut down. That's what it means to shut down non-essential businesses. And then environments that were high risk but essential, things like abattoirs, um, read, uh, like wholesaling, cleaning, the things that actually keep our, us all going in a time of lockdown, they had quite strict requirements to make sure all their staff were kept safe. Uh, and you know, coming out of the lockdown, there was also compliance measures. So in businesses had to be part of the compliance uh, schedule. It wasn't just put onto individuals. And we see with, with Gladys's a lot of her um, you know, her framing is this consistent f f falling back onto individual responsibility and common sense, but the government isn't actually doing the hard work of confronting their most vocal constituents, which are the business community, um, and doing the hard work of crawling into the business fabric and uh, instilling a more, you know, a, a, a healthier way that we can move through this trans... Uh, to diminish transmission and to... But yeah, isn't this government. beyond... Australia, isn't this us just being narrow like we tend to be? I mean, you know, a year and a half ago, this virus was loose in China for four months while we were still talking about whether or not it was real. And we were saying to each other, w w what is lockdown? They they're locking down cities in China. They're locking down entire cities. And we were talking about whether or not it was a rumour. We were seeing videos on Facebook of, of people being arrested in the street and we, we were asking if they were real. Mm. Um, and we couldn't believe this thing was real and we were doing nothing about it here, nothing. Except we, had, we, but we had a very real experience here in, yes. in Victoria. And I just but what to... I'm saying is that this virus was, this strain was sure. loose in India four months ago. Let, let's just hear from Can everyone though in relation to this particular question about Victoria's lesson. And, you know, we went through it so hard well, that surely someone had to pick up the, the learnings, as the phrase didn't goes. didn't learn anything from Victoria, Virginia, because... New South Wales doesn't think it ever needs to learn anything from Victoria. New South Wales is a beast of its own. I mean, they just looked at Victoria and thought, oh, poor old Victoria, they're in lockdown. Bad luck, we don't have to worry about them. And what's happened up there has been an absolute disgrace. I mean, you had the Chief Health, Chief Health Officer, Kerry Chant, asked, what is essential retail? And she said, oh, I can't define that. Uh, what is essential work? Oh, I can't define that. I mean, you have to define that. In Victoria... Nothing was open except for a supermarket, a petrol station, a chemist and a bottle shop, of course. <laughs> Nothing else. But in New South Wales, they've just let that rip. And our questioners question about uh, the targeting of Fairfield, that has been an absolute disgrace. I mean, that, those suburbs that make up that LGA are full of hard-working Sydney siders who have to go out all over Sydney every day of the week, tradies, plumbers, sparkies, whoever they are, and, and we're suddenly targeting them and saying, oh, you've done the wrong thing, you can't spread this around. They can't afford to stay at home. If they stay at home, they don't have a, a salary, can't put food on the table. Mukesh, okay, from a GP's yeah, can, point of view, what do you I think? Can I say that the lessons we learned in Victoria didn't come easy? Mm. We had a tough time beating seriously with my organisation, AMA Victoria. My uh, state president, Julian Wright, was in the face all the time saying, what are you doing about... Let's talk about PPE. We couldn't get PPE. Uh, we couldn't... You know, we had... We went through a really tough time dragging people into dealing with this from the health point of view, from making sure everybody was safe in health spaces. There was vi victim blaming. The, they're blaming my colleagues who were getting sick and unfortunately some dying for their, for, is their fault. Mm. It took a lot of effort. Um, my state vice president, my, my vice president now president, was in that from the from the hospital's point of view. It took a lot. We lost a health minister. We lost the secretary of the health department. We split the department into two. We've gone from a situation where we had no public health response to actually having to get it to a position where we can work. So yes, we have learnt in Victoria, and people should be learning from us. Um, but we have had to learn it the hard way ourselves. But now's the time to move ahead with those lessons that we have learned. Um, yes, we've got to do social distancing. Yes, we've got to keep, keep masks on. 
And let's not be scared about it. Actually, I love my mask, believe it or not. And, and, <laughs> and, and you know, the, the, the next thing is, what do we do next to make this whole system work? No yet? one loves a mask. No. I feel naked without it yeah, on. Exactly. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> you those few weeks without it? Did you feel no. weird? <laughs> I did. Can I, can I add no. yeah, that yeah, it, girls, it yeah. absolutely wasn't smooth sailing and I think yes. um, we saw that with some of the treatment of minority communities absolutely. and uh, there was a massive debate and discussion about how those things could have been done better. Could we send in busloads of nurses into the towers, the social housing towers, before we sent in the police, right? Yeah. And these were logistical questions because yeah. it was like a wartime mobilisation. Well, and I think like in, in workplaces as well, it wasn't smooth sailing. Like There were employers that were still forcing workers to go yeah. to work where there were outbreaks mm. and they weren't disclosing who had... Um, who was who had the outbreak? How many people? Mm. And so workers actually had to take it upon themselves to work together in spotless cleaning, in uh, toll retailing, and actually close the, the sites down to, to make sure they were oh, Just great. to jump in there, yeah, Mukesh, yeah. we're at risk of, um, because it was such a hard one lesson, of Melbourneians actually considering it some, you know, fabulous thing that everyone went through. It was not. No. And we'll see how the five-day lockdown goes here. But on your point, and also yours as well, Steve, about what's happening in the Western Sydney, I'd like to bring in Awa Abu Samra via Skype, who's in lockdown in South West Sydney. Awa, you work as an interpreter in that community. What's life been like going into lockdown and the experience of what's been described here tonight as a heavy-handed response? Um, it's actually been uh, very difficult um, uh, managing that. Um, the levels of anxiety um, for in the community have been quite high. Um, uh, as you've all mentioned, that the messaging has been um, something of uh, problematic. It hasn't addressed the communities that it's policing. Um, there was the, uh, the changing um, uh, pace of the different information that was being disseminated, you know, daily. Um, it was confusing. It was um, uh, demonising uh, a community for not having access um, to that information that um, was the responsibility of government to make available for the multilingual com communities who live in those parts of Western Sydney. So you haven't had that, that communication that's, been, that's come from authorities, that's sort of been left to communities themselves to, to figure it out, is that what you're saying? Well, it's been very delayed. We've seen it in the last two days, but um, that, that means that ever since these changes and the more um, stricter rules have kicked in, we haven't had that information um, available to our multilingual communities. Um, what we found is commentary um, that was coming through from the Deputy Police Commissioner um, uh, uh, shifting that onus back onto the community and family members and friends to actually um, interpret or translate that information to uh, individuals who had language difficulties, which uh, left me baffled um, as an interpreter who um, who works in that space. Um, there is uh, no way to confirm whether that information is being um, interpreted correctly. Uh, we don't understand the um, language ability of the people he, he's relying on. Um, uh, it's, it's surprising because police within their own um, uh, practices have language service policies that actually um, can utilise the services of professional translators and interpreters to have that message be communicated from a consistent source accurately so that community organisations and community members can then communicate that through their channels. Uh, what we ended up finding was um, uh, the community having to mobilise to fill that gap in such a short amount of time um, and being policed on these policies that were not explained um, properly. Um, and we had, uh, you know, with, with all good intention, people who are bilingual um, communicating those, um, uh, you know, messages on uh, short videos online um, that left a heap, a heap amount of information missing. So, for example, the one that I caught was an Arabic speaker um, uh, giving instructions to people who were living in those areas to stay home and wear a mask if you went outside. And it left out uh, an array of information about not travelling without um, a, a valid reason, not leaving your um, local government area within a 10-kilometre radius, um, I mean, I work in those areas and my kids go to school outside of the area and I had to actually travel on Monday with mm -hmm. my children um, to pick up their school resources. And I could tell you that the levelling of anxiety within me and I speak English fluently and I can find information when I want to, um, I still have to have a conversation with my children that put them at ease that what are we going to do if we get stopped by police? Mm. Do we have a right to be outside? What are our rights when we interact with police? Um, I remember and those that's conversations. Very problematic. Yeah. And incredibly, that's Virginia, I spoke to the, the they, three. Our, thank you for that. Spoke to the three mayors of those local government areas during the week on, on radio, and the government made the announcement that they were targeting Fairfield, Canterbury, Bankstown, and Lakemba areas, 
and they never even spoke to the local mayor about it. Yeah. Didn't even ring them up and, and say, well, we're going to now have to lock you down. You're going to have a harder lockdown than the rest of the city. And yet all of the people in the area uh, that, that our uh, questioner was just talking from, they looked at Bondi when this first broke out. That's where it seeded. No yeah. one said Bondi had to be locked down. No uh, one. I know Mary Louise wants to jump in. Mukesh? Yeah, look, um, the, the key lesson for me from that communica communication with uh, other groups is that it actually took the groups themselves, our local go government area took responsibility here. We worked together with the local practitioners. We got the state government involved and they st start to learn. Is it right it, now? Is it... It's, it's better now, absolutely. We've actually got a, a, a... The current health minister set up a task force to look at this in more detail, especially around vaccinations. And that messaging is improving because people were scared. You know, what do I do? If I, I don't want to go to a hotel, I don't leave my family. So we... We conjured up, you know, wraparound services so people could stay at home and not be dis 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 disadvantaged. Um, ha have people to walk the dog, get the shopping, whatever they had to do, to make it comfortable to stay at home. And that wasn't happening. They were treated as citizens and people who are unwell, not as, as, uh, as terrorists and, and people who are criminals, which is actually how they're feeling. Mm. Mary Louise? Mm. Oh, look, the World Health Organisation received a document that was... Uh, written by an independent group telling us how to prepare for the next pandemic and for the next period of this one. And it includes not just all of government, but the whole community. And so you really do need to bring the community along. They know each other well. They know what the issues are. And we love our in, um, multicultural community, but my goodness, we neglect them um, from the beginning of this pandemic. Uh, we haven't really brought them on, on board, really. And I, I take the, the point about we didn't lock Bondi down, where we should have, an, on, I mean, we, on the sixth day, uh, seventh day, it, it, the numbers increased dramatically, and we still turned a blind eye. So uh, I think there's a, a little bit of a slow um, a period of time for the government to wake up to the fact that they're in a, in a bad situation. And it just makes uh, the local government of Fairfield and others feel mm. as if they're treated uh, badly. But in fact, I think it's the government learning catch up on their knowledge. I, I want to go to the next question, but before I do, just very quickly, Mary Louise, we've got a five day lockdown announced in Victoria now. From your reading of the figures and the growth of the figures in the last few days, would that do it? Um, <laughs> You're in a very precarious position, and if, thank goodness you've actually locked down now, because if you waited any longer, you'd be in the same position we are. Mm. Uh, when we had six cases, we should have locked down, and now we have 930. So a week is basically an incubation period, and that's the time when your epidemiologist will look at the wastewater, the testing, and see how many were not in full isolation and unlinked. And then they'll make a decision. OK, let's go to our next question. It's a video from Fox and Thomas Mulder, truly. Hello, my partner and I are casual workers in disability care. We have lost our income due to the lockdown. The $600 per week from the government is not enough. If I had worked these 20 hours, I would have earned $1,100. My question to the panel is how do I make up this shortfall of $500 per week when I have to pay all my outgoing living expenses? This is a good one for Alison, but uh, Michelle, I'd like to bring you in there as well. I mean, th this, this unfairness is something we've seen right through the pandemic. And again, maybe it takes us back to the why haven't we learned anything question yeah. that was asked at the beginning. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't know the answer to that question. It seems uh, fr right from the very beginning, it seemed like the assistance needed to be in the form of of assistance in that living, that daily living, you know, at the very least in, in kind of utilities and things like that that we all have that we all we can't expect to come through this in the same way in the same and uh, the same lifestyle that we had I guess in the beginning um, but and, and in these particular professions it seems to be always these professions that suffer the most doesn't it in mm. these in these caring professions and um, that that's hard to understand how that that can be the case how is it that it goes back to what is an essential service, doesn't it? How is it that broadcasters seem to be, like, essentially able to work, Steve, and yet somebody who, who takes care of other people is mm. it considered um, non-essential? Especially the disabled. The whole disabled sector has really been 
left out of all these things and people like that you know do amazing work yeah the people who are the hardest people to look after and yet they, they're, they're not I'm able sure to do the work. I'm sure there'd be plenty of people who'd be very happy if I wasn't working. No, but I mean, yeah, I mean, I get it, but you're also lots just, Steve, I was, I was hoping you might get to that eventually. You're also <laughs> disseminating information, and I'm not, I'm honestly not... You no, know, no, but it's, it's a, it's a fair not... point, Michelle. Look, let's go to Alison on that. It's a question for you, because... But also my question is, who, who's taking care of, of their totally. clients when they're not able to work? Who no. takes care of them? Well, you but, get but this but issue, the, though, the, don't issue, you the issue really is, is, is the money enough? And I know that you think that, that no matter the fight between the Victorian government, say, for example, and the federal government over uh, who's getting preference preferential treatment with federal payments, you still think it's all too low? There's absolutely no reason why those payments can't be livable payments, right? If we, we have to accept, if there's one lesson we can take collectively as a nation through the pandemic and even the, the federal budget's coming on the other side, hundreds of billions of dollars have gone out the door for all sorts of things, mm. stuff we needed to keep everyone afloat, keep businesses afloat, but also things like $18 billion a year on tax cuts for very wealthy people, right? So we've got plenty of money. Why do we choose? Why are choices being made at a federal government level and, in this case, New South Wales state government, to chastise people who are already in low-paid professions uh, and in some of the most important work, frontline work, caring for others, like in disability care, um, and why wouldn't we extend to them the payments that are required to, to get by? And why would we instil this sort of level of precarity and insecurity on people? The point is we don't have to. Um, th this package that's been crafted with Commonwealth support for and with the New South Wales government uh, has been done with something in mind, and it is in mind to ensure that people on uh, the welfare payments also do not get a scrap, right? So it, it makes sure that there's something like 200,000 people in New South Wales who are on a welfare payment but derive income from their work. They can't get any of these, these, uh, those payments. So that's, these are people even in a worse position than, mm. than um, our... Well, the federal public. government would say, you know, we don't have a bottomless pit of money. I mean, JobKeeper uh, cost us billions. And I think the federal government thought that we were going to get through that and JobKeeper would finish and we wouldn't have any more outbreaks. And so what they've suddenly got is this outbreak in New South Wales and they've had to work out, well, we, we're going to have to help the, the vulnerable here. But what they've they had did... a head-butting exercise with New South Wales. Well, Originally, the feds didn't want to give any money. Well, yeah, of course. And then they were brought over because of the fact that Gladys had become... But a... how, how, much we, how often are we going to do this? Every yeah, time we've got a breakout... Can I finish your point? Because yeah. the point is that... JobKeeper was... The government was dragged, kicking and screaming to JobKeeper. That wasn't Morrison's position. They wanted to put everyone onto unemployment benefits. So there was a... It was the work of the ACTU and other organisations that pulled the government to a position of a wage subsidy. They pulled down JobKeeper way too early, as well as the coronavirus supplement, which gave people above-poverty existences, millions of people. It lifted 400,000 people out of poverty, the biggest poverty-raising measure um, that we've ever had in history. And uh, they were pulled down unnecessarily. This package comes now two weeks into their... Uh, two weeks too late. And it's because they had to re recook up all of the policy. They pulled down all the architecture, had to remake it, and they've, they've rebaked it and they've redevised it in a way that's um, more unfair and leaves people like our, our questioner in a worse position. And also they've been cutting funding to social services for 20 years and you can't do that and then have an international crisis pop up and expect so something to happen, expect social services then to pick up the slack. There are none. There are no services for low-income people in Australia. There are no services to pick up the slack for those people. There is no-one to help those people. Well, they are the services. They are the services. Yeah. There's no-one to help them. I want to hear from Mukesh on, on this question, though, because the, there are actually health cons consequences to the, to the question asked. Look, people are, are doing it tough. We know that. Um, uh, people are, are getting sick. Um, one of, you know, there's many of these packages that came in shouting and screaming, and then we got them. Uh, for instance, we have health uh, by video or tele telehealth. And, and, course, and, and retaining that to some well, extent. Well, yeah. that's right. So, for some reason, from the 1st of July, we seem to have thought that um, uh, the crisis is gone um, and that most people can afford uh, to do their telehealth using video, uh, whereas most people still like the phone. Um, and the weird thing, of course, is that when you do a telehealth or video consultation, you have to sign off for it. 
I don't quite work that one out, but that's what it says on, on, the, on, our, on our sheets. So people are doing tough. You know, the cause needs for help with mental health has increased dramatically. Again, uh, fair, fair go. Government has given increased access to mental health consultations and psychology services, which is great. Um, and there was the, the, the job keeper, and whether it ended too, too early, we understand that. I, I think we have thought it's all going to go away and it's all going to be rosy now, and it's not. So it's actually OK to say, look, we got the timing wrong, maybe we should think about this again. But, Mikesh, can I ask you, who thought it was all rosy? Because I, wait, months back when they pulled down JobKeeper and JobSeeker and said, it's all done now, the pandemic's yeah. over. They were, I was sh screaming and shouting that those policy architecture had to re remain in place yeah. because we were not free. Yeah. And I'm sure the healthcare sector I, said the same exactly thing. That's exactly right. We, we've been... Since the bushfires, actually, remember those? So we've had another crisis before that, since the bushfires. Yeah, fire. exactly. Before we move on, um, Steve, I just wanted to get a quick reflection from you, quickly, if I can. What did you make of the war of words between the Victorian government and the federal government over New South Wales getting preferential treatment? The feds deny that that's the case. I mean, I think if you go back to the original long lockdown in Victoria, the federal support was there and there has been a lot of money spent in Victoria. I just wish that state governments and federal governments, no matter what political colour, would get over the parochialism and just get on with it. I mean, come up with the solutions. I what, mean, you want a federation or something? Well, there's petty, <laughs> stupid arguments about, you know, who got more and who didn't. I mean, just let, let's move on from that. I don't think that helps anybody. Very quickly, Alison, is it a petty argument? Does it matter? It does insofar as... Uh, this is something like a wartime mobilisation that we're living through. And if you've been left out on your ass, which is what happened to Victoria, there's, there's hurt feelings. Like, there's a businesses that lost millions, millions more than businesses will lose in New South Wales. That creates an uncompetitive environment. There are individuals that were left without income, casual workers who were sacked in Victoria that had no income, whereas in New South Wales they will. But in terms of moving beyond this, I think it is upon us to, you know, recognise that the Federation is being pulled apart um, in a really serious way. Since it formed, this is probably the biggest test it's ever been through, it, and I it think is. that it's upon us to reach across our state divides and, and yeah. um, express solidarity with each other. It's a very different kind of federation. Our next question now is a video from Stephen Luke, and uh, it, uh, it comes from Stephen Luke. Yesterday, Prime Minister Morrison suggested that advice from Atagi had slowed the vaccine rollout, indicating that Atagi was now making decisions normally reserved for government ministers. Is the government actually running the vaccine rollout? Is the government taking responsibility for the vaccine rollout results? Or is it being left to the faceless men and women of a target? From beautiful Achuka, very noisy Achuka as well, Mary Louise McClaws, we'll start with you. What did the, what, what did the Prime Minister do in, and say in relation to a target? What did it mean to you? Well, I... I... Targi gave the right decision that um, those under 60 need to understand that the data on um, adverse events hasn't changed. Uh, then the federal government wants people to use the AstraZeneca because we don't have enough Pfizer. And so I think there's a bit of um, blaming, shifting of blame uh, towards Targi, where in fact Targi is basically saying the data hasn't changed. And that really anybody who's already had a Pfizer, yes, go and get another one. But really, we should be um, using Pfizer and the young ones. And I just remind you that the AstraZeneca uptake has slowed down for dose one for people 60 to 69. So they're the group that really, uh, for some reason, have got a bit confused about having AstraZeneca because the 70 and over have had dose one and two. So I, I think that all of this has caused a great deal of confusion in the community. There's been many changes of advice from uh, Atagi Mukesh. Yeah. And, uh, and of course, the, the issue of uh, indemnifying yes. GPs like you in giving the AstraZeneca to a slightly younger cohort has been a live one. Uh, look, we um, have been advising on this since January. We knew the vaccines were going to come. We needed to be ready for this. We had a whole lot of things that we've talked to government to say, these are things you need to do. One of which was actually to say, uh, there should be some indemnity uh, in the situation, especially if there were going to be mishaps. But you've got it now, haven't you? Well, no. So it's been promised. It's been an announcement. Right. Uh, but nothing's come through. OK. And what uh, Marie Louise is saying is absolutely right. The advice hasn't changed. Um, and uh, advice has changed, and we need to stick with the medical advice, and this is what it is. Yes, there is opportunities for people who are not 60 to get the vaccine, mm. but you always had to get that conversation, and the Prime Minister was right, with your doctor, 
um, and then make sure that you do that. But we're getting people in their you know, 80s, 18s and 20s and 25 saying, I want a, uh, that vaccine. And that's not a reasonable thing to be doing. And so you, so you, you wouldn't vaccinate someone? No, I won't. In my practice, I won't vaccinate anybody under 60. Until with AstraZeneca? I see, with AstraZeneca, until I see that, uh, uh, that uh, policy in place. I would then do it with that conversation not expect can, I, can I just jump in yeah. there? So the indemnification is one thing which sort of yeah. protects you legally then should there be a, a suit that arises from an adverse effect. But what about the cons medical concern itself about uh, vaccinating someone that young with AstraZeneca? Do you have that concern? Yes, I would. Uh, so I'd be, I'd be really concerned about somebody who's even under 40. Um, and again, a whole I'd lot of people I know in their 20s, when the Prime Minister said that the other week, said, yes. you know, go and talk to your GP. A whole bunch of people I know went and got AstraZeneca straight away. Yep. They're fine, they're good, which is great to hear, and they had no hesitation doing it. Well, we had a lot of people at the very beginning. We started vaccinating 22nd of, right. of March, and most, well, none of the people touch wood that we've had have had any problems. And we know it's a very small number of people that are going to get problems. And the other thing we have learned is that we know what to watch out for. And if you know what to watch out for, you get in early, you can do something about it. But the, the, we, we actually need to um, use the, the Pfizer for the people under, under 60 at the moment. If we do go down to 55 or 50, as we were doing with the previous mm. lockdown, uh, there needs to be that conversation. There is a risk. It's not a big risk, but there is a risk. Uh, and people uh, who may have a misadventure should be looked after by government if there's an issue. It's their programme. They've bought it. They've sponsored it. They've said they're going to pay for it with a, a no-fault conversation. Well, let's see please if give the identification comes through. Please give but us that. Wasn't Michelle, it, can I just ask... Uh, sorry, sorry, just jump in there. Um, Michelle, did you get vaccinated? I've had my first Pfizer shot, but it was really hard to find. I, I did everything... They told me to do. I went on the web website. I went to my GP. He didn't have it. He didn't, didn't know what to do. He said, go to the website. I went to the website. I got an appointment that was ages away. But I found out. I had my ear to the ground. And I found out that I could get a shot at the commission flats near my house. So I went down <laughs> in there. Williamstone? Hey? Are you in Williamstone? Yes. How did you know? <laughs> yes. My local there? area. I know about it. <laughs> I didn't recognise you with your mask. So hang on. Were, so you, were you allowed to do yeah. that? Yeah. Yeah. So I went down there with my um, uh, Medicare card and I got my shot and a free coffee. Were you, were you taking a Pfizer <laughs> vaccine, though, from someone from the Commission no, no, who was no. supposed to get it? No, 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 no. OK. Are you joking? Just checking. Uh, no, um, they're pretty rough flats. Um, <laughs> they no, threw, they I... were throwing eggs down from there. And, and no, they're... me, they're not. No, they're throwing <laughs> eggs at people down from no, there. <laughs> no, no, me, they're not. I've got his friends. So how did you manage to work the system? Uh, I don't know. I think that's the way the system works. They you... didn't have enough arms to put vaccines in. and they don't... If you don't use it within six hours, you of lose course. the vaccine. Yeah. Right. So it's yeah, better in, a, in an arm. There are places they don't advertise it, Steve. Now, Steve but I can, I can take you if you want to go. I'll protect <laughs> you. No, I'm right. I've had my two AstraZeneca. Oh, okay. I'm fine. Oh. But I know people in Sydney. I know a guy who's a fireman and his wife who's a, uh, a sports uh, physio. And they can't get Pfizer. They've tried to book and it's a week, two weeks, three weeks down the track. And they're frontline people dealing with people, and they can't get Pfizer. I mean, but AstraZeneca didn't that save the UK? I mean, Absolutely, it did. So, 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 I, I, so I why, like, why are you uh, so against? No, no, I'm not against it. Um, but, you know, I, for, for me, the worry was in, in the UK the, the, their cutoff was 30, and they did very well. But then when they dropped the rate of infection because they did so well with the vaccination, the, the community rates increased. So they actually increased it. Um, Mary Louise, you can sort of. Coming on this, if you like, you know, that they went up to 40 because it, of, that, of that ambient spread. And I think that's the problem we, we keep but have the to The non medical recover. people here, though, are going, well, if it saved the UK, why can't it save us? If we've got so much of it, well, we make a million doses a week. Mary Louise? Well, I was just going to say, Steve, that one of the issues is that Delta now has taken over. And AstraZeneca is fine for saving people from death and hospitalisation. But the group that you want to save, from transmitting it, acquiring it and transmitting it, are the younger ones, the 20 to 39-year-olds. And they need Pfizer because it's got a better response to Delta. Mm. And you can give them the second shot faster. Now, sure, AstraZeneca's great. I've had my AstraZeneca's and I'm probably not going to die or get severe illness. But because of my age, I don't see as many people as young people do. They've got a very large social network and that's where you want to cut the cycle of acquisition and transmission and that's why I'm more supportive of Pfizer for the young ones. Oh well Alison you're sitting here and you can't get anything right? Well no and also young people are they form the largest portion of the the workforce that moves around a lot right yeah. and we pay also taxes and 
keeps the healthcare system going. We'll get to you eventually. All of that. Stop, stop fussing. <laughs> Gotta raise the flag, you know. Yeah. Um, so I, I watched the Q and A program last week or the week before, and there was a really great question from uh, a bloke called Tristan, and he asked, and I think he represented a lot of young people as well as I did, which was just. What can I do to make this better? I'll take a risk if it's going to ensure that we, as a, as a policy, can collectively move out of these lockdowns and these problems, we can move onto the horizon. And the, the response from the, the experts on the panel was that on a health front, there are more risks to you of taking AstraZeneca and it's better that you vote. You wait for, for Pfizer. And then on a policy front, you going out and taking that vaccine isn't going to change the timelines. Would you take AstraZeneca? I, as soon as... Morrison did that presser. I was one of those people on every yep. for, place I could go looking for it. And then I watched the program and I also um, I followed Atagi's advice. I'm also the daughter of a registered nurse and <laughs> I, I respect the public health care system and in a time of, you know, Trumpian attacks on all of our, you know, important institutions, I, I'm just going to follow that advice. And there's also research, I don't know, that's come out today that shows that is, um, you know, reinforced by... Uh, uh, research that shows that young people are more at risk of blood clots than they would. Um, Which but is, if, you're, if hence, I have COVID on my... Advice, if, yeah. COVID, if I was in Sydney, I would be getting AstraZeneca. Steve, well. just before we move on, I just wanted to ask you... Your, I'll, I'll come back to you, Mary-Louise. But I just wanted to ask you, what was your read on Kevin Rudd's intervention into trying to get us some Pfizer earlier? <laughs> oh, he's just had a bit of uh, tension deficit syndrome, Kevin. He likes to... <laughs> Stick his hand. I don't know how that letter would have ever got into the hands of the ABC. I have no imagine. idea. Couldn't imagine. <laughs> Absolutely um, no idea. We had Malcolm Turnbull on the, the project to talk about that, and Malcolm and Kevin are now best buddies. I uh, <laughs> don't remember them being so friendly <laughs> when uh, Kevin was trying to become the UN Secretary General. Attention deprivation does that to yeah, former Prime does. Ministers, I suspect. Um, Mary Louise, do you want to just jump in there? Yes, I was just going to say that there's um, evidence that AstraZeneca works very well, or Pfizer. How, and, and that was from the UK when they were looking at uh, the impact from vaccinating young people uh, from December to the end of March. Problem is that that was with Alpha, and now there's Delta. Delta's twice as infectious. And we do know from Qatar and from uh, other areas that uh, AstraZeneca seems to have at least a... Ooh, 20 percentage point lower vaccine, uh, vaccine efficacy, uh, even with that second dose for symptomatic infection. And in people like Alison and, um, and Michelle, uh, they yep. are young enough yep. to be able to transmit it. And we want them to have a great um, immune response uh, so that they don't get symptomatic infection yep. and therefore their uh, viral load is lower and that they're less likely to keep spreading it in the community. Do you think it's possible Michelle is that... taking the age discount, I've noticed. I've got to move on, Michelle, so just quickly. Ask if, if, if it's possible that we in Australia have become blasé about actually getting COVID. Like, we're so worried about AstraZeneca. Like, I just don't want COVID. Yeah, I think I would take... Honestly, well, hence, hence the change in the Atagi advice, which is if you have COVID, even this variant at large, go and get whatever vaccine yeah. is available to I don't you. Want so, anyone I love to get COVID. Yeah. You know? uh, very, very quickly, Mary Louise. Yeah, it, that'll be fine if our government offers a booster of um, messenger RNA vaccine for your third one, and then that will increase yeah. your immune response. Our next question now comes from John Rose, and it's on video. Hello, everyone. With the challenges posed by the more infectious Delta variant and the need to reach herd immunity, do you support fast-tracking approval of allowing one AstraZeneca vaccine followed by one Pfizer vaccine? Would this be likely to improve efficacy and bring us closer to herd immunity sooner? John, bringing the cheer this evening, which is lovely to see. Mukesh, uh, vaccine mixing, where do we stand? Uh, well, we stand that we can't do it. Um, we, we stick with two doses of whichever vaccine we have. It's great research but, coming out of Oxford saying it's uh, very effective. And, and in Canada, there's research there and they're doing that in Canada. We have to go with where our advice is uh, when we are running out vaccines on behalf of the government. And so we stick with the, the uh, results that we Do you think given. it'll change? Uh, Lots of things are changing, and we'll, we'll have to see. And uh, you know, uh, Mary Lou is saying that a second dose of mRNA with uh, yeah. people for AZ is going to be the way to go. That that might change the question. Mary Lou, are you aware? Um, I understand it is being discussed um, at sort of TGA level and at TAGI level. Do you know where those discussions are about man or allowing vaccine mixing here in Australia? 
No, I don't know where it is yet, and they probably have waited for more evidence to come out, particularly around the safety. There had been a safety issue looking at um, people who had that mix and match were twice as likely to get a fever, but they haven't been able to identify that that fever is uh, will have any um, negative impact on your health. Um, so I don't know why they're waiting. Maybe they're a little bit risk adverse, um, but you know, Europe is starting to use it. Um, the UK um, will probably start to use it. They're starting to roll out their third booster for the elderly. Um, maybe they're going to start using that. But maybe because we don't have any Pfizer to give to the young to start with, <laughs> they may wait. Yeah, exactly. Let's go to our next question. It's on a similar topic. It's uh, again on video. It's from Darren Gatcliffe. If the vaccines do not work, what does the panel suggest as the next steps? Can we now start treating it like we do the cold and flu? Alternatively, what other regimes or treatments does the panel suggest we can use in the future? It's a good question. What if the vaccines don't work? Well, this time last year, if you remember, we are going through horrendous times here in Victoria. Um, we had over 100 days of lockdown and we didn't have a vaccine. And, of course, we'd be begging for a vaccine and we've got one. And I take great pride in putting nearly 9,000 vaccines into people, uh, many of them second doses with, with Pfizer, uh, and that's making a big difference. What we were doing last year was the advice that we had. I, I was actually in this, on this slot here talking about the social distancing and the masks and all those things, which is still important. That's the key lesson we've learned. Don't soldier on. Stay at home. Don't go out, you know, don't, don't uh, be too, too gregarious because you, you need to know where you've been so that if you have got a problem, you can, you can do those things. But the, the question went to what if the, uh, the, uh, yeah. what, I don't... the new variants, what if they don't cut through? Well, we, we have to work with what we have in the, at the moment. There isn't much research, unfortunately, like, like there is with some of the other medications, to say what medications are actually working in this space and will work well. But we, and, can't, keep, we can't keep going through lockdowns, no. can we? I mean, uh, and that's that, not the other way no, to no, solve this. There has this, to be a better way of doing this. There absolutely has to be a better way. And I think, you know, Mary Louise, you said at the beginning that everyone's doing it differently. Um, in the States, we have a CDC. In other places, we have those sorts of centralised ways of doing this. So people all are singing off the same hymn sheet. We asked for this back in March, actually. I remember very March. Yeah. One hymn sheet, one song. Let's get it all together, and then we can then work it together. And so we don't have to turn the barriers one, one week that you can't come to us, and next week you can't come to us. Can't the other way around. Steve, let me come back to you because, I mean, in the radio program you do, you would hear this discussion all the time about learning to live with it. Mary Louise will have a different view. We'll come to her. Steve? I think there's been some, um, some very inflammatory and incorrect commentary from some high-profile people in the media about how just let it rip. It's not, nothing more than the flu. Uh, we'll get over it and, and we'll be OK. Uh, that's not the case, and that's irresponsible to do that. I mean, you need to talk to people like Mary Louise and Makesh who know what they're talking about, and these blowhards who get on there and go, oh, well, you know, don't panic, everything will be OK. Yeah. Uh, that's really bad to do that. I interviewed a 25-year-old girl today who caught COVID in the Joe Bailey hair salon in, in Sydney. Right. Uh, and two months on, um, she's still not go... No, no, no taste, mm. no sense of smell. Her lungs are scarred, she can't breathe properly and she's only just now struggling to recover. If you don't think this is serious, then talk to someone like that and you'll find out it is. Mary Louise, is there, is there some way... Let's say the efficacy doesn't hit as high a mark as we would like, particularly with these new variants, unfortunately. Is there some way we could learn to manage it as an endemic disease like influenza? Mm -hmm. Well, first of all, I'd like to say that the messenger RNA vaccines are faster to be able to be uh, modified to then address uh, variants of concern. So we'll have to get used to having uh, boosters uh, that can address this. Secondly, these vaccines at the moment, even with Delta, still protect you from at a very high level from hospitalisation and death. If you don't have the vaccine, um, you are really at risk of... Um, being, you know, dying uh, if you're older, if you're 60 years and older, twice as likely to be hospitalised in the UK. Um, but I agree that we... I don't like the term live with it. It's, it's a term that I think authorities uh, use so they can kind of throw their arms up in the air and go, it was all too hard and you guys aren't doing your job and wearing your mask and doing what you're supposed to do. I prefer using the term um, trying to mitigate or reduce risk. And I agree with everyone on the panel that we can't keep using lockdowns. 
but uh, we should be using science. Now, there's rapid antigen tests that we could use at the border with truck drivers and all those wonderful essential service people that need to go from city to city, um, you know, delivering. And they could have a test at the border. Now, our authorities say they're not perfect. Well, gee whiz, neither is signing a form that says you haven't been in a hotspot. I mean, that's really not perfect. So we need to start understanding that the more we vaccinate people, at least to 67%, that's the minimum of the total population, or heading towards there, we can start doing this sort of thing instead of going into lockdown. Just quickly, before I move on, Mukesh, are you a fan of the rapid tests? Uh, so there are um, rapid, rapid tests actually developed in Queensland that are being used in the States because they've been developed that well and they're useful. We have an Australian manufacturer that's been um, authorised by the TGA with those Correct. tests. Yeah. Uh, and I think that these things are going to come. You can do point of care testing as well. You know, in our practice, we have the ability to do a test in 20 minutes. Um, we, we aren't, uh, we are created by NATA, but not by, the, by Medicare. Uh, that sort of thing is, is possible in other places. You can do these things more rapidly. Uh, the technology is there. Yep. I actually took that machine to the Department of Health this time last year. <laughs> but anyway. Um, Did they listen? Was, uh, they think it's a good idea. We just got to, the, the settings change. It takes a long time for yeah. bureaucracy to change and bring things like point of care testing into play. But when they're there, they're brilliant devices that you can make a material difference instantly in somebody's life. Let's go to our next question. It comes from our audience member here, Nick Murdoch. In an attempt to promote vaccination and stay-at-home orders, the federal government recently released a shocking new ad campaign depicting a young woman gasping for air whilst attached to a ventilator. However, the vast majority of those under 40 are ineligible for a vaccine due to an apparent lack of supply. Young Australians like myself are now seeing our fully vaccinated friends overseas getting back to normal while we are still living in and out of lockdowns. Why did the Morrison government spend taxpayer dollars to produce an advertisement featuring the wrong demographic and not one promoting the benefits of vaccination instead? Well, we've got two young women on the panel here, I guess, who are... Yeah, you'll yeah. take that age discount yeah. too. Yeah. Who I guess this, uh, this ad was aimed at. Alison, did it work for you? It is, like, if there was... It was possible for Morrison to gaslight anymore. <laughs> like, that is, like, the upper limit of it. Right? It's, like... It's, um... I mean, even talking of, like, the fatigue of lockdowns, I can't entertain <sighs> that when, like, everyone's made huge sacrifices. But until I have something in my arm and an opportunity to access that vaccine, um, I won't... I can't entertain that lockdowns are going to, you know, these have to end. Because we can... We do it and we save lives doing it. Um, I... First seeing that ad, uh, distressed, and I thought, why is the federal government... <laughs> there we go. Why is the federal government... Uh, why is it trying to instill deep fear in people? It has not given us a public health campaign since the pandemic hit 18 months in. Uh, I grew up in a time of slip, slop, slap and, you know, big public health campaigns that you can do them when you actually want to achieve, you know, public health outcomes. What this ad for me is doing is achieving, distilling fear. It's, it's deepening fear and I think this is very typical of the way the federal government's politics are shaped. It's not concerned about... Uh, bringing people together, of which all of the research shows that um, messages of solidarity and take, make this sacrifice because it's for the good of everyone. If you look at everyone else's ads internationally, smiling faces, people coming together, the sacrifices we made, we're all better off together. And we've got that. And it features a young woman, a young person, who can't even access the bloody vaccine. I mean, it's... It's a bad ad, but, I, I mean, I think it's unfair to say that uh, Scott Morrison is trying to deliberately somehow gaslight people. I mean, he uh, hasn't had a great record in his career of producing great ads. We all remember Lara Bingle, and that didn't work that well either. But <laughs> the federal government w would genuinely be trying to come up with some way to get more people to get vaccinated. Oh, you just that don't get us millennials, ad. Steve. You don't get us. <laughs> <laughs> OK, Michelle, no, actually, honestly, explain the millennial point yeah, of view on this, then. <laughs> no, but honestly, I, I, will, I will confess to my age, because I am struggling to care about this issue, Steve, I have to admit, because I just think this whole story about how old the lady in the ad is is such a kind of... Um, Typical, and I, I'm, go, I'm going outside... Say it, you've had I'm your father. Outside, no, <laughs> you've but, had your but, but I'm going outside of Australia again, and I'm saying, look, it's just a very... Um, privileged kind of argument to be having. I think, you know, fly two hours north of Darwin and, and land in Indonesia, and do you think anyone cares about how old the lady in the ad is? Like, we're so lucky in this country, and if that is honestly 
the most important thing that we can talk about. I know it's not the most important thing, I, I, and I, I'm sorry, and I know you, it's, it's gaslighting and all of that, but, um, but I think, gosh, we are really lucky in Australia. Can I, I'll try another but, but, angle but, for but you. But can I just finish what I, I just yeah. want to, on, my, my reaction to that is that, you know, in Indonesia they're running out of oxygen, and the money that was spent on that ad would have bought a lot of oxygen. For so you're saying the advertising campaigns, it doesn't matter what I they come up with. I, I couldn't care less. Can I try another angle? Lady in yeah, the no, go on. I want, to hear from, I want to hear from Steve again. I think he was cut off, so, um, which rarely happens. But I, Alison, I mean, I mean, I take, I'm like, being very flanked. Flanked. He's flanked. He's <laughs> very flanked. Yeah. I think it's like deeply offensive to say that people concerned about um, a virus that's killing millions of people. And no, they don't have an ad. Yeah, but the fact they got the, the point of the context of the ad is that we don't have any vaccines. That's the context of the ad, and that matters. And so, I will take away the word gaslighting because it's something that you didn't. No, like. uh, no. It's, but how I about I use the word lowering expectations? Because if if we look at that and we say this is okay, everything that's going on right now in this deep crisis-ridden country of this deep political crisis and this health crisis, and this is okay. For me, that's not okay. And I think that's part of being in a democracy, part of lifting expectations, and about looking out across Australia and saying like. We can do better than this. It doesn't make us privileged. You know, we can sit back and be like, it's great that we're not, like, we are saving people's lives right now. But the reason why we're doing that is because Australians believe in the public healthcare system and they believe that we can make sacrifices to save each other's we're lives. We're lucky to have a public healthcare I, system. I want, to, I want to come to Mary Louise McCall's. Mary Louise, I'll come to you, but can I just quickly say, for the record, I think it's important because, you know, everyone's having a red-hot go at the advertising campaign here. We did work very hard to try and get a member of the federal government on the panel this evening, including, we asked Greg Hunt, Barnaby Joyce, Jane Hume, Bridget McKenzie, David Gillespie, number available to us. I understand we will have one next week, which is terrific, but just so that position is represented, they're not excluded, they just weren't able to come. Mary Louise? Mm -hmm. Oh, well, it's my understanding that this ad was made last year and only released now. And I think that it's the wrong time to be released. It uh, reminds me of the first pandemic I ever worked in, with, it, which was HIV, and with the bowling ball ad yep. that made people think that HIV was, you know, would hit you randomly. And then there was a brilliant ad by... Um, Glenn Mabbott and Edward Richards, and it said, if it's not on, it's not on. And the reason that was such a great ad is it, it engendered um, a, an empowerment uh, of people that got it, that you didn't have to worry about your um, sexuality. All you had to remember was, if you're going to have sex and that's casual, if it's not on, it's not on. And it was really fantastic. And we need an ad for particularly the young ones that I'm so concerned about, the 20 to 39-year-olds, that gives them power about, you yeah. know, the fact we love them and we care for them. Uh, the well, problem with the, the ad uh, just going back was that we didn't have enough vaccine, so they didn't want to have this fantastic ad to get everyone to rush out and get an injection because we didn't have anything to put in their arms. That's right, and hence the silence. Um, but speaking of sex, and I've always wanted to say that on this show, <laughs> the next question is on video from Emma Pearce. Hi, panel. Thanks for taking my question. So I am currently in Sydney in the extended lockdown and I live alone and I don't have a partner. So my question to you this evening is, do you think that the government should create a single bubble? They seem to say that it's okay if you have a partner to come over for intimacy. Uh, so I feel it's a bit silly that you can have someone that you might have met for six months over for sex, but you can't have your friend of 14 years over for a socially distanced dinner. I'm really interested to know what you think. Thank you. This is such a great question. Brad Hazard, the New South Wales Health Minister yesterday, tried to explain uh, this uh, intimate bubble idea and he said, what I think it would be better is if everybody, you know, if you go over to your significant others, go out on the balcony or go for a walk down to the park. <laughs> now, I interpreted that as him saying you should have sex on the balcony <laughs> or the park. I don't think Brad had any clue what he was talking about. I think about, that's a very mild you, winter in Sydney. Brad. That might work, actually. I mean, <laughs> you couldn't do that in Melbourne, but maybe in Sydney. Not at this time of year, no. <laughs> Mary Louise, is there a bit of a, a disconnect here? Oh, look, I take a point, and I wrote a piece last year uh, for about Victoria and about a single about bubbles and uh, and intimate bubbles. And I think she has a point. And I suggested in the piece that you identify that person who is important to you for whatever reason they're important to you, and that's who your bubble belongs to. Okay. 
and, yet, and take the risk. But, Michelle, the, the serious part of this question is that we all know in, in lockdowns around the country, but most particularly in the extended one in Victoria, it was emotionally scarifying for some people. There are people who are not beyond it. The, the requirement yeah. for services for mental health in the state of Victoria still not being met. Yeah. Th this matters. Yeah, and actually, to go back to the, the Commission flats, um, oftentimes there are elderly people who live in those environments who don't speak English, for example, and who really rely on visits, who rely on other people to bring them food, to bring them medication, to to be able to have access to them. And so, uh, you know, th those bubbles are really important for those reasons, for their survival, literally. Is there, is there a medical reason for the New South, New South Wales government to stick to the rule that they are, Mukesh? I don't think so. I, I mean, if you've got someone... You, 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 other countries have created bubbles with one other person. It doesn't have to be your intimate partner. And this is a, a wonderful idea. Um, you know, the people were doing great things on Zoom, for instance, over the, the lockdown. My own 80-year-old, you know, 82-year-old mother was doing dance classes on, on that, which actually kept them going through that awful time. Mm. And that kept them fit. And these are the sorts of things that people have done, which we've forgotten about. We've learned these sorts of things about mm. social outreach, about connections which people need. We are human beings. We need to touch, feel and talk to people. But see, all Mikesh, the time. didn't we go through this in Victoria and there was a, the first two thirds of the lockdown was the guidelines were significant intimate partners only. And I think there was a yeah. lot of pressure and people mobilised to say, why does it have to be this type of relationship? And I think it did open up to significant people and I think it sounds like New South Wales needs to do the same thing. Mm. Yeah, and, and Steve, the, the anxiety that's provoked by lockdown, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's not just sex that, that meets, that, meets no. that need. No, and the mental health uh, impacts of, of what we're now going to go through again for another five days, Sydney could go for another five weeks. Uh, we won't really work out how bad that's been for years to come. It's horrendous. I think that's everything we've talked about tonight, though. I think it's really crook of us to be giving Sydney a hard time and saying, oh, you didn't learn from our lessons. It's like you were saying, it took us a lot of hard learning and I think it's unfair of us to be criticising them for not learning. I really do. We, we, it's fun, though. We're talking about the government, not people. But even, yeah. like, I, I get that. Policy I do understand that. I do understand people. that. But it, it, yeah. it's hard. I mean, they, they are populist leaders, our leaders today, and that sucks. And I, I don't approve of that. But that is the way that we have, frankly, trained them to be. That is who we vote for now, and that is all we vote for. We don't vote for leadership. We vote for people who pander to us consistently. That is what we vote for in this country, and that is what we've got. And so Mate. that is how they behave. They don't want to lock down. They don't want to do the right thing. They don't want to do the smart thing. They don't want to be leaders. They want to do the popular thing I... every single time, and that's what we voted for. OK, and that's let's see from Alison. Yeah. Well, we democratically elect leaders, and yeah, so I know. Part, these discussions are part of pointing to um, obligations on government, yep. especially in a time of a great crisis, to uh, make decisions that are in the interest of people long-term, their health, well-being, the economy long-term. And so um, I, I absolutely understand, like, the point you're making about this era of populism. I think what's been really remarkable about this time is it's been a... The states have be kind of come forward again as this... Uh, you know, the last bastions, really, of social democracy and, yeah. like... The, the welfare state and public health care. And I think, actually, Australians are really rallying around states because they can see that they're providing... Well, uh, on that score, thing. Steve, I, I think it might surprise some people tonight, but I think you have some grudging respect for uh, the Premier of Victoria, Daniel Shut Andrews. Up. <laughs> yes, I didn't think I'd ever say this publicly, but I think uh, Daniel Andrews... No! <laughs> did an OK job, although, I must well, say, I mean, okay. uh, his, his failure on hotel quarantine was, was appalling, but okay. um, he has been tough... And when he said he's going to do something, he actually does it. The problem that Gladys Berejiklian has, she did not want to be seen as someone who was locking people down. And so she had this lockdown light and now she's got the problem that she's got. So grudging respect, eh? Wow. I didn't say those words. I think you <laughs> said that. Yeah, I think, I think you might be. <laughs> he might be watching No that. one wanted that job. Nobody wanted to do that job. It was an no. incredibly difficult time. Nobody no. would know either. Raquel Garcia in the audience has our last question this evening. Hi, I'd like to present you with a fantasy scenario. If you were handed the top leadership position to get us through and out of this um, pandemic devoid of politics, media bias and avoidable factors that have seen Australia in the situation that we're in right now, how you, would you do it? 
All right, so one great idea each from our panellists to get us out of this mess. I'd Mary make, Louise? Uh, Mary oh, you'd Louise, like to start... I would make Mary Louise McClaws <laughs> Prime Minister. Oh, <laughs> look at that. Today. Well, that sorts the problem. Right now. Mary Louise, would you accept the position? What would be your big idea? Oh, first of all, I'd redo the vaccine rollout to focus on the dose one for the 60 to 69-year-olds. They really are not taking up their vaccine. Secondly, I'd be focusing on the 20 to 39-year-olds. So those two groups are the two groups that I'd be concerned about. And can I have one more? Quickly. I get on the phone to Bibi Netanyahu and uh, Biden and ask them to help me get more Pfizer. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Alison? Uh, I think the pandemic has shone a light on the scourge of insecure work in Australia and they've insecure workers not knowing when they're going to have their pay week to week are having to turn out rain or shine, sickness or not, and um, put money on, bills on, uh, food on the table. I would say uh, strengthen our industrial relations laws to allow casual workers to have more permanency, have sick leave so they can stay home. It's going to help us get through the pandemic and um, allow them to come together in the workplace and advocate for better, better wages and conditions so they can power themselves to push COVID out of the workplace as well as have income security to, to get through. Steve Price? I've given you my suggestion. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. That's She's it. Prime Minister. She's in charge. <laughs> All right. I would take the parochialism out of it. I, mean, I know that's a big ask, but uh, even today we had uh, uh, my friend Daniel Andrews pushing back <laughs> over browsing in New South Wales, having a shot at what uh, Gladys Berejiklian had said. I just wish that these state premiers and the state and the federal government could all work together. I mean, we haven't heard this phrase for a while, we're all in this together. Guys, we are in all, all in this together. For God's sake, just fix it. Michelle? I would refund social services and uh, the public service in Australia so we might have a shot at actually rolling something out. All right. <laughs> and Mukesh? Yeah, I'd like to see a lot of the promises that have been made come true. If we get no full compensation, people don't get so scared of getting a vaccine. We can get some of the uh, other age groups to get their, their, their uh, AstraZeneca that we do have. We need to get more Pfizer into the country. And we need to have that parochialism out of this. I think a C, a, a, in a CDC kind of outfit that does all of these sort of nationally, uh, the, these out, out, you know, out, outrolling of what we need to do and do it well. Uh, so we can just get on as a country, mm. not as little villages. And that's all we have time for this evening. Would you please thank our marvellous panel, Mukesh Hakawal, Michelle Laurie, Steve Price, Alison Pennington, and in Sydney, Mary Louise McClaws. <laughs> and thank you for all of your terrific questions as well. I'll be back with you next week, live in Melbourne again. Olympic swimming champion Libby Trickett will be here on the eve of the Tokyo Games. They are going ahead. Regional Health Minister David Gillespie and broadcaster Russell Howcroft will also join the panel. And you can join me tomorrow morning on ABC Radio Melbourne. Until then, stay safe and go well.